All right, guys, this is Jerry Learns Business, brand new channel, but we are kicking it off with a bang. This is Bobby from Demitas. I used to call it Demitasi, but it's A lot Demitas. of people do. That's yeah, a lot of people it. butcher it. Dude, Bobby, welcome. Thank you, man. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. So I've been enjoying your coffee for a long time, and I still remember the first time I had a flat white, and I just remember there's so much care put into it, and I had a neck injury at the time, and somehow Ooh. drinking that flat white, it made my neck injury kind of go away for a little bit. That's the honest truth. That's why I love yeah. it. I always associate Demitas with like a slight um, curbing of the pain I had in my neck back that's in the day. So that, that's the secret. That's why I love you guys. Awesome. I wanted to bring Bobby on for everyone tuning in because, um, you know, I want to talk to business owners. I want to learn from them. So Bobby, why don't we get started on your journey? How did sure. you get into coffee? And then how did you decide to start your current coffee chain, coffee brand? Yeah, I used to be a corporate lawyer. Uh, was pretty bored and miserable uh, at the time. Um, and then I was drinking a lot of coffee and, and especially coffee specifically. We were ordering coffee beans from all over the country, from especially coffee roasters. And at that, this is, Jesus, nine, 10 years ago now. So the uh, foodie movement was just underway in Los Angeles. So, you know, spending a lot of time in cafes, just you know, recreationally and really intellectually getting in, interested in the business. And I was like, you know what? I'm not married. I don't have kids. I'm bored out of my mind doing monkey work as a lawyer, um, which, you know, I got into corporate law, not because I wanted to, but because I had to. And it's ironic talking about it now because I got out of law school right as a financial crisis hit. So the kind of law jobs I was looking for weren't available anymore. They just vanished. Um, and here we are almost 10 years later and here's another crisis, right? Yeah. Um, as we, as we, as we are. So, um, so I was just, you know, not happy with my situation as a lawyer and, and decided to just roll the dice on a, on a coffee, co coffee shop. Did you find that doing, having the law background, it helps you start your coffee brand? I think having a legal background has its pros and cons when you're trying to start a business. I think on the one hand, you have a, a degree of sophistication and confidence when you're dealing with people who would try to bully you. So contractors and landlords and that kind of thing, where you can just kind of, you don't have to be afraid of them uh, and, and sort of level the playing field there. But I think on the flip side, you, you, as, as a lawyer, you are very risk averse and you're probably not thinking about the right things that you ought to be thinking about as a business person. Um, and so I think there's, there's sort of pros and cons to having that a lawyer's mentality as a business person. How long did it take you to get your first storefront out? From when we signed the lease? Mm -hmm. Oh man, too long. I mean, we didn't know anything about anything. Um, you know, it's funny before we opened, I worked as a barista um, at some shitty little coffee shop in Santa Monica uh, on campus there in uh, at SMC just to get my, just to learn the ins and outs of working behind bar. Right. Cause there, there's a, world of difference going from, Hey, I can brew good coffee in my kitchen to understanding bar flow, cleanup, maintenance of equipment, all that kind of stuff. Right. So, um, so I learned that, that end of it pretty well and got some good training there. But then when it came to the, I would say the really big important things, uh, construction, location, uh, laying out a bar, we didn't have a lot of help with that. And I wish I had, cause we made massive mistakes. And so when it really, when it came to construction, we were, probably took us like five, six months to get open. Uh, and really you want to get, you want to get your doors open in under four, three months, three, four months, if you can do it. I so we, see. Learned, we learned a lot of, we made a lot of mistakes. We learned a lot of lessons the hard way. We continue to learn a lot of lessons the hard way. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think, excuse me, the entrepreneurial path, a lot of it is, it's just like you make so many mistakes because no one's really teaching you how even the people who've had success, their mindsets, their situations, the luck and everything is just different. So no yeah. matter how much you get mentorship, you're still going to have to make the same mistakes. Yes and no. I mean, so, and I, I've never really considered myself a mentor to anybody, but I think I've drawn in a lot of aspiring cafe owners. And so people have come through our doors have now, I think we're up to like seven cafe owners now who used to work for me and now open their own shop. So I think that's awesome that, you know, to the extent that I, been able to contribute in any way, shape or form to getting them to where they are today. Mm -hmm. um, and I think having me as a resource to the extent that they, you know, I was always an open book 
and a resource to them like hey think about this you know deal with this construction like that or landlords or whatever i didn't have anyone like that i didn't have anyone i could, could turn to and ask these questions so mm -hmm. um i think if you are starting a business to have have someone you can talk to a mentor or whatever who's been in the industry who knows these are the pitfalls these are the issues you might run into it's invaluable and, and you know if we if i had had someone like me to sort of hold my hand a little bit in those those first couple of years i think we would have been a lot more successful a lot sooner mm -hmm. um, and made a lot fewer mistakes costly mistakes frankly and so yeah try to yeah. find people who know what you who've done it before you and, you know i wasn't doing anything that hadn't been done before right it wasn't some novel approach to anything so uh so the mistakes we made could have been avoided if I had had a little bit more industry help. That's a, such a good lesson. Seek mentors. And also, Bobby, I'm getting a great, you're a very humble guy. I can tell. And that <laughs> will take you far. Like you're, you're able to see where you made a mistake and how to get better at it. And I think that's what makes your brand so successful in the LA area. Yeah, we do. Okay. Um, we're certainly not the big, biggest and best known brand in Los Angeles. And there's people who've been, started after us and we've had a whole lot more success than us and and so um for for me personally we're always trying to get better and i tell everyone i hire that that you know we're always looking to improve and we're trying to fix everything we've ever done wrong and i don't know i mean i think part of life is making mistakes and but you know if you don't learn from those mistakes then i don't think you're really getting the value of those mistakes exactly exactly so bobby tell me about that first day you know after the five six month finally it's your first opening day how was it how, how many people showed up what was like the mentality of everyone working at the store so it's a mixed bag of emotions when you get open that first day especially if you're um you know it takes so much out of you to get a get anything open in los angeles so by the time you actually get the doors open you're exhausted. Mm. It's already taken a pound of flesh out of you. So you're, you're not so, it's not so much that you're like excited to get open as you're just like, you've just finished running a marathon. You're like, Oh my God, finally. Um, and then I think our expectations were a little unrealistic. Um, mm. and we were super slow. And so to have put in an insane amount of money, left a very lucrative job in the legal world, put your heart and soul into it and to get there and open doors. And, you know, you have like a trickle of customers coming through. I think it was a little, and it took us a long time to get to a place where we were sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a slog. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I was a little uh, heartbroken for a while there, you know, and I think, you know, anytime you do your own business, anytime you do anything on your own, like you put so much of it of yourself into it. And then, so, Everyone tells you don't take it personal and to be patient, but I don't, I'm not a patient person at all. Like I want, I want it, I want it now. I wanted it yesterday. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I mean, for me, that was a very tough pill to swallow. It still is a tough pill to swallow. I mean, you know, we've, we've opened cafes, we've closed cafes, and we've done it all at this point. And um, yeah, it's, it can be, you know, it never gets easier. Yeah. It's so interesting that you talk about the necessity of patience, but also the necessity of wanting it right it's like you always have to balance the two because yeah. if you're just a really patient guy then you might not jump at opportunities you might not push yourself but if you're too kind of like impatient you're always frustrated so it's like always that struggle of okay where do i cr draw the line where do i set the boundaries yeah hey man i'm still trying to figure that out to this day yeah uh, yeah i, I mean have, i don't have know, any good answers for you yeah, I, I, I wish I had answers too, but I'm in the same boat as you. Like some days I, you know, I have some brands that make money on YouTube, some brands that don't make money. And then some brands that I'm like, why aren't you growing fast enough? So it's like mm. kind of the same world, but different because my thing's all online, but it's the same. Yeah, like, yeah. Sure. Like some days I have to tell myself, just be patient, be patient, keep working hard, keep doing it. When in doubt, diversify. And if something doesn't work, mm. cut it. You know, just like, I just have to always remind myself too. Yeah. Yeah. No, I hear you. Tell me about when you opened up your second store, what was the decision process like to be like, okay, we got our first store. Now let's branch out. We were looking around. I don't know that we were a hundred percent committed to opening up a second location at the time, but very, very good opportunity sort of fell into our lap. Yeah. Uh, in that someone who was operating in a neighborhood we wanted to be in was leaving, uh, which is crazy to me. Uh, I think, I think the guy was an idiot, frankly, um, because he ended up, you know, I think he thought he could get some concessions from the landlord and he was, you know, in the heart of downtown Santa Monica. It's like, no, dude, you don't get concessions from your landlord in the heart of downtown Santa Monica, uh, especially when the economy was good. This was 
2010. At that point, you know, we were on the other side of the recession and the city's growing again. So mm -hmm. I don't know what he was thinking. Um, so we got into a fully permitted space that already had a customer base. You know, we opened it on the cheap. Uh, then, it, you know, and got it open quickly, maybe two months. And, you know, from day number one, that was a knockout success for us. You know, it did very, very well day one. Um, so, I mean, that that was kind of like, wow, this is a totally different ball game from the first one we opened up, which took us a year to get to anywhere uh, sustainable. So it was it was good. It was it was it was for me every every time we open a new location it's a chance to not make the same mistakes to learn to improve and to do something a little bit different or do something better and so it was my first chance to like not make the same mistakes and, and sort of you know clean slate with a new space right mm -hmm. um and, and that's not to say that we didn't make massive amounts of new mistakes but at least we didn't we try not to make the same old mistakes yeah and so uh so it was cool it was that that one to this day is our best location and uh you know it's it's been it's been fantastic you know there we have so many different problems that we have at other locations so it's just funny to see how they all sort of run into different things you know so i think what's interesting now and it's something probably a lot of viewers who will stumble on this talk later will ask is how did you decide on your name right it's an interesting <laughs> name but for example i didn't even know how to pronounce it for a long time yeah. how did you decide on demitas I wish I had it. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so at the the law firm I was working at, we were we were you know there was a group of us who were like the coffee nerds, and we were just kicking around names when I when I decided like hey I should do this. I think first and foremost you don't want to um, have a name that is already widely in use by other coffee companies, other cafes, and so it was available, which I thought was you know a plus. And then I think for my money, I wanted something that sounded kind of exotic, but was mm -hmm. actually something very humble. And it's just a French word for an espresso cup, right? Like a very humble half cup, right? That's what it means. Um, so, you know, people use it in the industry, like, oh, you know, pull me a shot in a demi or whatever. So I like that it's humble, but it sounds fancy. And I think that's that's really kind of encapsulates a lot of the specialty coffee world, at least how we, how we approach it, which is, you know, people think it's a super fancy thing, uh, but really it's just, it's a humble bean, right? So uh, I think that's kind of our approach to golf. I see. I see. And then yeah. how did you decide on the menu items, right? I think one of the things that's interesting about um, me, let's say comparing you guys to Starbucks is that Starbucks maybe offers a bigger variety, but all of their drinks aren't as good in quality as your drinks. So how did you decide, okay, what are we going to focus on? What are we going to have? What are we going to not have, et cetera? I think we came at it and continue to come at it from two different perspectives, right? One, you want to draw uh, you want to differentiate yourself from like the thousands of other, especially the coffee shops that have proliferated across the city. And really the, the sort of the, the model that the specialty coffee model that everyone sort of replicates is like, okay, we're going to have just like a super limited menu, no fancy drinks, like, you know, just basics, you know, pour over latte, cappuccino, flat white, whatever. And then kind of almost like a, you know, bare bones kind of thing and really just focusing on like doing five or six things. And everyone sort of, you know, especially when Handsome opened, everyone just sort of copied that model, right? Like limited menu, nothing, nothing fun, nothing exciting, no syrups, blah, blah, blah. And I didn't like that. I thought that took some of the fun and soul out of a cafe. Uh, but on the other hand, you don't want to be, you can't replicate what Starbucks does and you can't compete with what Starbucks does, right? Like, all the blenders in the world aren't going to compare with like a, a Frappuccino Starbucks puts out. Like they just have the right chemicals. They've been doing it forever. They perfected that. So we didn't want to do anything that you could get at Starbucks. You get a better version of it at Starbucks. So we don't have a vanilla latte because you're not going to get a better vanilla latte than they, what they're putting out. You're not going to get a better Frappuccino than what they're putting out. So, and also like, what's the point of copying Starbucks? Why would anyone come to a knockoff Starbucks? Mm -hmm. So we wanted to be different from Starbucks. We wanted to be different from especially the coffee sort of, you know, one of the intelligentsias out there. So we just kind of muddled through into a middle path where we're like, all right, any, any drinks we do, we're going to make from scratch. So we make all of our own, you know, seasonal syrups and we wanted to have a seasonality to everything. So we always have something kind of new and fun and different. We wanted to make sure that we were presenting it in a certain way and that we were experimenting with flavors that you wouldn't find anywhere else. And that was really important to us is to just do something different that you wouldn't be able to find anywhere else. So it gives people a reason to come specifically to you versus like, you can get a vanilla latte anywhere. You can get a matcha latte anywhere, but you know, you're only going to get, you know, I mean, before the crisis, you know, we had like, a, you know, 
we, we had trying to remember what our last seasonal drink was. It's been, my head's been so full of like trying to figure out how to get out of this mess. Mm-hmm. We were about to roll out like, you know, our sour cherry iced tea. And um, we had a, uh, it was like a strawberry latte type thing that we were rolling out. So we, you know, we always try to do something different. We've never had the same, in the nine years we've been over, we've never had the same seasonal drink twice. Wow. So that's, that's a, pride, a point of pride for us. Mm-hmm. And I was going to follow up with this. Have you ever tried something that you kind of were like, oh, that was something that was not exactly the right move? Have you ever done something like that um, every, in your journey? Every day. Mm-hmm. Um, we were doing a strawberry sage latte. That's what we were doing. I had to look it up. Um, mm-hmm. Oh, boy. I mean, from, from buying really expensive pieces of equipment that were just total lemons and we had to end up taking out and eating the cost of that. Um, we've tried... Oh, Jesus, all kinds of stuff. You know, when we first opened the first one, the idea was, and it's funny because now I've seen other cafes do it better than we did and, and successfully, but we wanted to do this like, oh, stand anywhere, like we'll serve a drink anywhere, kind of bar, like a bar, right? Mm. And customers are just confused. Like they walk in, like, I don't understand. Where am I supposed to stand? stand? Like they were turned off by it right away. They're like, no, I need somewhere to stand. I need somewhere to pick up. Like I need, I need that structure. And so within like a month, we were just sort of like, all right, fuck it. order here, pick up here. <laughs> And it kind of killed the way we were trying to set up our, our initial cafe, uh, which is funny now because like, you know, the guys over at GMB have done it very well and, and hat tip to them for, you know, figuring it out because I think that's a fun way to, of executing a bar, if not somewhat complicated. But um, so that was a mistake we made early on. I think we've done, oh man, I mean, the list of things that I wish we had done or not done differently or whatever. It's a long list, a very long list. I um, see. Yeah. For okay. sure. I mean, dude, I mean, we've gone into locations, spent a lot of money building out and close them after a year. And, and those hurt because, you know, you really do put, put a lot of effort into every, every location you open and for it to crash and burn sucks. Yeah, exactly. So right now you guys have a location in downtown, you have a location in Santa Monica and you have a location in mid Wilshire, right? Those are your right. three locations. Yep. And how long after you opened up the Santa Monica location, did it take you to open up the mid Wilshire location? That one opened up pretty quickly too. I mean, it was a small space, uh, is a small space. Um, maybe a year after Santa Monica opened, something like that. I have to mm-hmm. double check the dates. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I see. I see. Yeah. Um, I, I used to um, go around Mid Wilshire a lot. So it makes sense because Mid Wilshire is kind of like a real artsy type of like up and coming area. So it's really cool yeah. to have a cafe there that, that kind of like has a very cool like artsy vibe. Yeah, that, that space, I don't know about that neighborhood. Sometimes I wonder if, if that's a good neighborhood for us to be in. You know, I think, I think one of the problems, especially coffee, is it, it only works in certain neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. Um, and it doesn't have this universal appeal that, like, you know, your, your big box sort of coffee beans and Starbucks is fit in anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, it's tough, dude, especially coffee's tough. Uh, and, and, and I think as the longer I've been in it, the more I've started to realize that you need to be very, very careful with the neighborhoods you go into. And, and I think we've, a lot of the mistakes we made boil down to not understanding the neighborhoods that we're attempting to get into. I would say, you know, Alfred has probably understood this better than anyone I know. They've gone into neighborhoods that really fit their brand well. They, you know, people in the neighborhoods that, that sort of resonate really well with what they do. Uh, and so that's something we, we could definitely take some notes from them for sure on that front and going into better neighborhoods than, than maybe what we've historically decided to do. And I think that's super interesting because, um, you know, I'm from the East Coast, right? But I've lived in LA for almost five years. Okay. And I think a lot of people who, let's say, are from other places that are not West Coast, they don't, they don't, they're, it's hard for them to picture that neighborhoods in cities, in, for example, LA and San Fran, are just so different from each other. It's like, literally night and day like santa monica is so different from venice which are we're neighbors right oh, sure. venice is so different from mar vista which is you know right next to it it's just like it's it's mind-boggling how yeah. the neighborhoods are so different oh yeah and i think i think east coast cafe culture is really different than west coast cafe culture too and and frankly you have density on the east coast that you just don't have in the west coast other than san francisco that really lends itself better to more successful coffee shop, especially specialty because you have, you know, dense urban areas with sophisticated customers who appreciate high quality stuff and 
really that doesn't exist in, in Los Angeles in the same, in the same way, you know, you have car culture here, which is just a different animal entirely. Yeah, exactly. Um, I know when I first started drinking coffee, it was probably after college. And part of the reason I used to drink coffee was because I would try to get my coffee and then I would like try to study or like try to do my work yeah. in the coffee shop. Right. Um, so for you guys, it's, it's more like you guys, at least in the Santa Monica, cause you guys have a patio outside people can chill. So it sounds like, um, Dimitas, it's more like the customer base wants to get the coffee and then maybe like hang out, just be more casual than like have a coffee and like, like do work and stuff like that. Was that kind of something you stumbled on later or was that always your plan? We, you, you, we didn't know what to expect. Um, you know, Santa Monica's that, that part of Santa Monica in particular is an interesting neighborhood because you have a, a, a serious amount of office workers who just want their coffee, take it and get out of there. And they have a lot of meetings there. And so you have, you have a, a huge demographic of those, num- those kind of people. And they're all in like tech and entertainment and producers and this kind of thing. And then you have like a, a good population of like people who live in the area, you know, you're everyone from, you know, soccer moms to people who work from home and they just want to get out and hang out for a minute before they go back home. So we get, get a really interesting blend of people there. And uh, you kind of have to have something for everybody. I think when you're in an area like Santa Monica where, you know, you're going to have to have the right sort of layout for people who want to sit and chill and have a meeting um, or people who just want to be able to get, get it and go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, my next question is about sort of, you know, when I go into your coffee shop, you guys have a lot of cool like partnerships with different companies, right? It's, I love getting a coffee with um, some of those bars or whatever, like those, those snack bars and those um, mm-hmm. breakfast things. Um, how did you decide on which vendors to kind of yeah. work with? So uh, as, as a company, as a local company, we, we want to work with other local companies before we start to partner or whatever, sell any, anything from somewhere else. Um, and then it just boils on like quality and then price point, whether or not we think our customers will resonate. So, so that's really, it. we get, we get calls daily. I mean, emails all the time. And once you have a storefront, everyone and their grandmother wants to get their product in your, on your shelves. And so we get inundated with calls and emails and Hey, I have this, I have that, I have this bar, I have that bar. And so you, you know, if, if there, if the product looks like it's, it's a good match for us, we'll, we'll ask for samples, we'll taste it. You know, if they want feedback, we'll give them honest feedback. Some people don't want honest feedback. Okay, you know that's fine. Um, and and then you know if, if there's room for it and we think it'll it'll pass through, then we'll, we'll give it a go. Nice. Uh, it, I yeah. laughed when you said some people don't want honest feedback because I've had incidents like that where a person told me he wanted honest feedback, so I gave him honest feedback, and then he never talked to me again. I'm like, okay, so in your in your mind, you wanted me to like temper the feedback, but I took yeah. it literally. <laughs> oh no, I I. It, you know, it's funny when first few years when people would come in and be like, Hey, I have this product, I have this coffee brewer, I have this, whatever, are you interested? You know, can you review it? Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, look, I'm, I'm happy to do it. But, and I would just tell them like, this sucks. Like you shouldn't pursue this line of or People even come with me, like they want like help with like launching a business, right? Like, Hey, I have this business idea. What do you think? And they always want that affirmation. Like, Oh, this is great. Go for it. You're going to get rich. Yeah. And I just tell people like, you're an idiot. Don't do this. Like, this is a terrible idea. Like, I wouldn't touch this if I were you. Like, I think this is a disaster waiting to happen. Mm-hmm. And I quickly realized after a couple, couple of years of that, like I should give a disclaimer before. So now when people email me and they want feedback, like, look, I'm going to be brutally honest with you because I don't believe in bullshitting people. Mm-hmm. So if it sucks, like I'm going to tell you it sucks. Like if it's mm-hmm. great, I will be totally honest with you. I'm not going to blow smoke up your ass. So, you know, and I will give you very, very honest, critical feedback that you probably aren't getting anywhere else. Um, if you don't want that, like, don't send me your shit. You know what I mean? Like I'm not gonna, or, you know, send it to me, but I'm not going to tell you anything, you know? So it's funny, but yeah, I've, I've had a few very critical talks to people about that. (laughs) What sort of criteria do you have to kind of like decide what kind of employees, what kind of people, baristas and et cetera, will work at Demitas? Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's a great question. I, for me personally, I I literally do all the hiring, you know, I, I, there's maybe been like two people I didn't hire directly and that's just cause I was out of town and we were in an emergency situation. Um, so from, from a, especially in, in the food and beverage industry, payroll is by far your largest expense. And so if you think about it in terms of where your dollars are going, people are your biggest investment and people are the face of your company, right? Like you interact with my baristas. You don't interact with me. You don't see me. I mean, every now and then I'll be on bar, you know, but 
chances are you don't see me and, and, I'm, a, and I'm not one of these like celebrity barista people or whatever. So you, the, nobody knows who I am. I can walk in and out of my cafe and most customers don't know, mm-hmm. which is fine. I, I've never wanted to be, I never wanted it to be about me anyway. So I've always very much very particular about who I hire, how I hire and the kind of people we want working for us. And I think, you know, broadly speaking, we want people who are passionate about especially coffee and people with a good work ethic and then people who, who can talk to customers while making coffee, right? And, uh, and so those those are the three things we're really looking for. And if you can check those boxes, you can have a pretty good customer service interaction with our baristas. Sometimes we're wrong about people, you know, certainly not batting 100 over here, but I think we've done a pretty good job at hiring people who, who are at least interested enough in coffee, who can talk to customers in a respectful way and, and who aren't pretentious either. I think you want people who are sincere. And, and I think part of that comes from hiring someone who's actually interested in coffee because then they bring that passion forward and are going to put in the work to make sure that the coffee is being executed at a good rate. Yeah. Um, a funny story to follow up on this. I remember one time I was watching some TV show and it was like a TV show where this reporter lady said she wanted a flat white coffee for two shots of um, you know, two shots of milk, right? So I was like, yeah, hey, that's an interesting thing. I never thought about that. So I went into Dimitas the next day. I told them, hey, do you ever do like a, like a flat white, but with two shots of milk? And they're like, well, you might as like this show, I'm telling the story because it shows how much they really think about coffee, right? They're like, yeah. um, well, you might as well just get a latte then. Yeah, um, exactly. And I'm like, and so they explained like milk and like how much milk and then why it's called what. And I was like, this is the first time anyone in a coffee shop ever like taken the time to kind of explain these things to me. Because it's like, you go to Starbucks or you go to other places, they're probably not going to take the time to really like teach you a little about coffee. No, so it's really yeah. cool. And that, that's like following up on what you said, like that's the, the quality of sort of the baristas and stuff that you hire. Yeah. And I think, I think especially coffee, there is so there is a bit of like hand holding with customers and meeting them and trying to get them to understand why it is they're paying a, a little bit more for coffee and why it is you're serving it in a certain way. And so you need people who can explain things. So, you know, you I mean, in our interview process, I, I will ask people to just really random questions just to see how they answer it. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, can you, can you answer a curveball question like that you don't have prepared? Cause that's so much of being a barista is being able to just talk to people. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, another thing that's really cool about um, the coffee that comes out of your stores is that, especially when, when it's a coffee that has like some kind of milk product in it, the, the baristas really take the time to kind of like create a design with the milk and stuff. And so how did you kind of like learn all that stuff? What, is that pretty standard to baristas or is it like something that takes, let's say a week of training for the baristas to be able to make oh, patterns? Yeah, sure. It takes a while. It takes more than a week to learn how to pour latte art properly. Um, yeah, latte art is, uh, I think, I think if you're going to run a specialty coffee shop, the latte art is expected. And, uh, the the purpose of latte art, I think is somewhat forgotten, which is it's to demonstrate to the customer that the milk was steamed properly. So if it's over steamed, it's too foamy. You can't get any art out of it. If it's under steamed, it's just too watery. You're not gonna be able to get any art out of it. So if you can pour latte art, then it's a way of, demonstrating that hey i mean the milk is properly steamed it's at the right temperature i made this in a proper way for you so that's the point of latte art and it's pretty and presents well right it's it's another you know so much of especially in the as in the food and beverage industry so much of it is now visually enticing as well so i think part of it is just having that coolness factor the, the presentation factor but it is really about demonstrating the cus- the, the customer that hey this was done in the right way Wow. And it's great that you shared this with us because I didn't even know that. I didn't even know that that. the underlying thing is to show that, look, the milk is the exact right temperature, the exact right brewing, et cetera. Wow. That's so, that's so fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. So um, my last question would be, what is next for you guys? Is it opening up a new store? Is it maybe like going online more? What do you think? I know it's kind of like in a weird time to ask that, but do you have any kind of like plans? We had a lot of plans before this year. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, that's a great question. I, I don't have a great answer for that. I mean, you know, we we saw our our online business quadruple in a month mm-hmm. and from a very low base. We, we, we didn't do a lot of online. It wasn't really uh, major. You know, we we're trying to grow it slowly, but really most of our online was for to, to drive business into the cafes and then for people who 
you know, needed some random gear or whatever. Um, now it's like, hey, we're, you know, we're doing a lot of online, which is we're not exactly built out to, to do. We're doing it. I mean, what we're figuring out, it's not a big deal. But, um, you know, the, that's been the, the gains and that have been offset by losses, obviously, in closed cafes, cafes that are down to like 30 percent. And then a huge chunk of our business disappeared with our wholesale. But customers, we were selling coffee to restaurants, cafes, offices, and they, they've all either closed or have pared down their businesses quite dramatically. So we've seen, you know, and, and for us, the real push was going to be to do more wholesale. Um, I don't know how realistic that is in this market at this point. So I don't know. It's a good question. We had plans to expand a little bit this year. We had some, we we're going to move our roastery and then you know, we had a lot of, a lot of moving parts this year. Now it's just kind of like, hey, let's survive the next year and see where the dust settles and what the world looks like. I think there's been a trend in, in cafe design in the last, uh, let's say, six, seven years towards big, expansive cafes with like restaurants in them and, you know, lots of seating and, and very high design and spending a lot of, you know, I mean, look at the new site glass space, for example, or the new verb space. Like they spend millions on their spaces, but they're, you know, roasteries and retail and restaurants and shops like a whole nine yards like a you know a Willy Wonka type situation I don't know what the post-COVID world means for coffee shops I think you're going to see a I think you're going to see the reversal of that trend I think you're going to see small shops take out only some outdoor seating you know window service that kind of thing so I think that'll inform a lot of the decisions people make going forward as, as to how to lay their space out and how they're going to design physical spaces to account for the new realities of, of the situation. I think, whereas, you know, restaurants, it's different, you know, it's different. We already do 60% of our business take out anyways, but to, to lean even more in that direction versus, you know, having more seating and trying to do more for here kind of stuff. So I think, I think it's an interesting to see where, where the wind blows here and, and how, how much consumer habits are going to change as a result of this virus and how much of it snaps back into place. I don't know. I don't have, yeah. I think everyone yeah. was trying to figure that out in these next few months are going to be very, I think difficult for a lot of people in food and beverage. I think more so for food than beverage personally. Mm -hmm. um, Cause that's tough. I mean, when you have, you know, I mean, look, if I restrict my seating and you show up in my cafe and you're like, okay, well I only, you know, all the seats are taken. Well, you just take your coffee to go. No big mm -hmm. deal. If you show up to a restaurant, you just go eat somewhere else, right? You're not going to necessarily take it to go. So I think more coffee is the, in a little bit better of a, of a situation, maybe. But, you know, we also don't have the ability to offer multiple items to people. So mm -hmm. I don't know. It's yeah. interesting. It's going to be a very interesting thing to see how people who are who have very large spaces, how they survive in this because, you know, those rents are tough. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's so interesting. I think part of the draw of initially what made me step into your cafe in the first place was it was kind of small. I was like, Oh, it, it seems cool. Yeah. You know, and there's no, there's nothing too, too big or pompous about this. It seems like a place I can get coffee. And I think, um, like you said, uh, because everyone is getting more used to working at home and probably part of that affecting corporate cultures, more people demand to work from home and not want to be in like a big office place where people are just gossiping behind each other's backs and stuff. Yeah. So probably what it's going to do is it's going to make these little stops, right? These little like breaks in the day where like they can just go to a place like the and be like, Oh no, nah, that's pretty cool. I can like chat with the barista chat with some people in line and then just like chill for 20 minutes and then go back to my home or go back to whatever. I think it's going to really, like you said, make these smaller boutique places actually have quarter with more relevance in like this post craziness world. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, I think I think it's going to be interesting to see how, as people start to work from home more, um, what what kind of opportunities that opens up, if any, for for cafes to sort of fill some gaps, you know, and whether that's offering more home office coffee gear um, or just finding a way to tailor that market. You know, we've been thinking about ways of of sort of incorporating those needs for people. You know, maybe like with a certain you know order ahead. I think is going to be big. It already is. I think having standing orders, I mean, I think there's a lot that we can do. So we'll yeah. see. I don't know. I think I don't have any good answers. Exactly. We're going to try some totally. talk with with sticks, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I just thought about this as we were talking. Yeah. So are, are you Persian? Yes. 
Okay. How, how is it to be like, um, is coffee drinking a big part of Persian culture? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. I, I, you know, I think, I think tea is probably bigger in our culture than, than, um, uh, than coffee, but I think just the, 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 the beverage, hot beverages as a social thing is huge in, in Persian culture. Yeah, absolutely. I see. And um, do you find, you just think this is so interesting. It's like so sociology. Do you find that you have like a Persian, um, like customer base? Not really. No, we're not, not, we're not in any of those neighborhoods. I mean, oh. you, you know, you have like two or three neighborhoods that are, have a, a large Persian population, you know, like Westwood, Beverly Hills, maybe a little bit Culver. Um, we're not in any of those neighborhoods yet. Um, I see. Maybe one day. Yeah, we 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 definitely had a number of um, like Persian recipes. You know, so we had like a pistachio rose latte and our sour cherry iced tea, and and sort of you know, a lot of the flavors that I've grown up with have informed a lot of the um, seasonal drinks that we've rolled out. Sure. Mm -hmm. And then the other reason I asked that question is, um, you know, you were working in in law, you had a steady job, and then you became an entrepreneur. You know. Asian parents a lot of times are kind of like a little scared when their kids go off that direction. Did you have like support or like resistance from your Persian parents? Um, no, my parents like bankrolled our operation. Um, but did they love the idea? Probably not. Mm -hmm. And they probably still don't think it's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Seeing as I make like a lot less money now than I did as a lawyer. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, I think they had their reservations about it, but they, they were very supportive. Sure. Mm -hmm. and I, I, I'm very lucky in that regard. That's awesome. That's awesome. So I think we can just end this with, um, let's say people who want to be entrepreneurs. We've learned a lot already from talking to you about sort of seeking mentors and, you know, learning every time you start something to not repeat the same mistakes, et cetera. What are some other potential advice you could give them? What are some other things they should watch out for so they don't make mistakes? I think it's so industry dependent, right? I think, I think you, I think to run a small business or any kind of business in, in any industry that you're interested in, you really need to get your hands dirty in that industry. I think that's, that's, that's a, a lesson lost on a lot of people who think, okay, well, if I read enough books, watch enough YouTube videos, I can, I'll get it. You know what I mean? And I think being able to do something is a lot different than um, running a business doing that thing. So, you know, I had, a, I, I had hired a barista who wanted to open up her own coffee shop. And, you know, I sort of promoted her through the ranks real quick when, you know, she was, she was solid and she was managing a shop. And I, and I told her, I'm like, look, management is one thing. Ownership is another thing. Like just, you know, keep that in the back of your mind. She didn't believe me at the time. She'll, she'll openly tell everyone that like, you know, she thought I was full of shit. And then <laughs> after the fact, she's like, boy, you were right. I'm like, ah, yeah, I know it was. Um, so I think, you know, getting, getting your hands dirty and understanding that, you know, just cause you, you know, let's say you want to build furniture for a living. Like you might be like a great furniture person, but the business aspect of it is, is something until you're doing the business or working with someone who's really going to walk you through the business aspects of it. Uh, it's just a totally different animal. And so to understand the bigger picture and where you fit in that bigger picture, um, I think, I think it's something to keep in mind before you launch anything. Right. So, I mean, if you're trying to, I don't know anything about building furniture, but you know, you might be really good at building it. And then, but then once you start to realize, all right, well, I need marketing, I need a website. How am I finding customers? Where are my supplies coming from? What are my margins? How do I value my time? And so going from like, you know, a passionate, something you're passionate about as a hobby to trying to make a living doing that thing. I think it's it, for a lot of people, I think they miss the ball. They, they don't understand. They don't think it through all the way. I had friends who were lawyers like me and, you know, jumped into food and beverage, not really understanding the grind. And being like, yeah, I'm very good at like baking. So I'm going to start a pastry shop. Cool. Like you might be the world's greatest baker, but until you're well, you know, until you understand that like, Hey, you need to be up like at 3am to start, you know, making dough to have it ready, you know, to be out the door by like 6am for people who are going to be there at seven, like totally different world. than like, Oh, I, you know, on, on the weekends I, I, I make cakes mm -hmm. and you, again, you might be the, the world's greatest cake baker, but turning that into a business is a totally different animal and to understand like the work required and what your life is going to be like, frankly, is, is a totally different thing than like, Hey, I'm really good at this thing. I'm passionate about it. And I want to do this as a career. So anyone who wants to make that transition into sort of from passion project to business, 
go work in the industry, go learn from people who've already done it and try to understand what their lifestyles are like, because, you know, I, I think a lot, it's, a, it's an eye opener for a lot of people once they realize like, oh, I'm gonna have to clean toilets. Mm -hmm right? Like I'm going to have to wash, I'm going to wipe the floors down. Like I'm going to have to deal with all of the nitty gritty bits. Um, and so to not understand any of that before you get into it, mistake I made, frankly, and, and a lot, I've seen a lot of people make those mistakes. And so I would just say, you know, learn, learn about all, all the aspects, not just the craft of it. Exactly. Exactly. And that's so interesting. And for people who ask me about, you know, how does it, how do you get into like creating content? I basically tell them the same thing. I'm like, it's not as glamorous as you think. You know, you only yeah. see 10% of it. You only see like when the video's out, you don't see all the like the planning, the headaches of dealing with like machine algorithm and all that. But yeah. if you really want to get to learn it, like get your feet wet and really see that non-glamorous part and then decide, wow, is it worth it to like spend a lot of time trying to like go viral, quote unquote, although people don't even use that word anymore because like is right? going viral is not even like that special anymore. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that's right on point. Bobby, this was an awesome talk. Yeah. And I think great. for viewers, as my new channel grows and, you know, as you guys have um, your online presence grows, I think we would love to bring you back and sure. yeah. maybe even like, I'm thinking of even doing like a coffee round table where I get a bunch of like coffee owners and like talk about coffee together. I think that would be kind of a future great. thing. Sure. Um, so for viewers who see this, um, put your questions below or you can go contact them directly on their social media. Give your questions yeah. and we can answer some of your questions in the future when we bring Bobby back. Definitely. Yeah. Happy to answer any questions for sure. Always. Definitely. Definitely. Okay, guys. So this is Bobby, uh, founder of Dimitas and um, they got three locations in the LA area. And uh, Bobby, I will start recording now, but we can okay. talk a little bit afterwards. Um, sure. Everyone watching, go subscribe to their channel. Um, oh, yeah. Go check out their stores if you're in the LA area. And of course, please share this everywhere because that's how we all grow. So, Amen to that. Definitely. Cheers, thank you so much, guys. And thank you, Bobby. My pleasure.